Hi, my name is Murphy. This is my booktube channel, Murphy's Every Whim. I'm here to talk about books because I love to. And today I'm doing one of my MEW or Murphy's Every Whim recommends three books. And today's books are about birds. Why birds? Well, I've always been interested in looking at birds, but on a trip back from Alaska, we were driving through the Canadian prairie provinces. And while I saw a lot of red-winged blackbirds, which when I was a kid, we called the rice birds uh, from my where I grew up in, in Southern Arkansas, but I also saw some yellow-headed blackbirds and I found those interesting and I wanted to know more about them. So when I got back to Iowa, I asked my ornithology colleague what they were called and he chuckled and said, yellow-headed blackbirds. <laughs> so um, unbeknownst to me, uh, he who caters to my every whim, HWC had asked that same colleague for recommendations for birding books and binoculars. And so that's what I got for my birthday that year. So that's where I became a fledgling birder. And since then, I've also started incorporating uh, birds into my art. I've tried drawing birds, but drawing is not my forte. That's not the kind of art I usually do. So for these reasons, I tend to be drawn to books about birds in some way or another. And none of the books I'm gonna talk about today are birding books. These are literally books about birds. And so the first one I wanna talk about, which I actually find very hard to describe, is A Most Remarkable Creature, The Hidden Life of the World's Smartest Birds of Prey, by Jonathan Myberg. And in this book, Myberg talks about the caracara, in particular the striated caracara. And I'll show the cover. This is a, a painting of a striated caracara. The striated caracaras are very smart and curious birds. Even though they're bird of prey, they are very social and will interact with humans and don't seem to be afraid of humans, which maybe they should because they're endangered. The International Union of the Concer for the Conservation of Nature has assessed the striated caracara as near threatened and estimates the world population to be fewer than 2,000 mature birds, which has gone down 500 since I first read this book. Uh, although Wikipedia erroneously lists the only extant species of caracara to be the crested caracara, which can be found in southwestern U.S., Cuba, Mexico, and South and Central America. Uh, that's not true. That's not the only extant species because the striated caracara is not gone yet. This book is extensively researched Myberg spent years studying the habitat, the history, the biology of the caracara, visited as many places where he could find caracaras being kept in captivity, visited the Las Malvinas, which is the uh, Argentine name for the Falkland Islands, which is one of the places that the caracaras live. They also live in remote areas of Tierra del Fiego, uh, and those are the only places they live. And unfortunately, because they are so gregarious uh, and they never leave that particular habitat, they don't seem to be able to insinuate themselves into other habitats, uh, their population is dwindling. I find it really difficult to describe this book. It's both scientific in a natural history sense, 
historical because it talks about uh, Henry Hudson, the 19th century naturalist, but also beautiful. It's beautifully written. And so I would just suggest going to someplace on the internet like Amazon or maybe Google Books to see a preview and read the first 20 pages or so, and I think it will suck you in. Here's a brief excerpt. Without ants or termites to mill them down, Tierra del Fiego's dead trees stand and lie beside the living for years, and crow-sized woodpeckers knock splinters from their trunks with the dull thunk of hatchets. Even now, when you can fly the length of Darwin's five-year odyssey in two days, Tierra del Fiego's fog-bound channels are seldom visited, largely inaccessible, and since the demise of the Amerindians who lived there for thousands of years, unpeopled. Ships occasionally used them for shelter from the mighty Pacific swells, but almost no one lingers. And that's from A Most Remarkable Creature by Jonathan Myberg. The second book on my list, uh, I actually found because it's a true crime book, and it's The Falcon Thief. A True Tale of Adventure, Treachery, and the Hunt for the Perfect Bird by Joshua Hammer. This book is written from court transcripts, um, public files, interviews with the people involved, visits by Joshua, and ha Joshua Hammer to the places that uh, things occurred, where the protagonist, if you want to call him that, grew up and so on. So this is a non, another nonfiction book. And it's the story of the National Wildlife Crime Unit in Great Britain and their hunt for a falcon egg trafficker who took eggs from nests in Great Britain and sold them to rich Arabian clients who were hoping to improve their stock of birds of prey and falcon and to win competitions. The National Wildlife Crime Unit, or NWCU, was created in 2006, and they would employ former police detectives, but police detectives who had a great knowledge and experience in wildlife crime. And these investigative support officers were not police officers, but and so they had no ability to, um, to search, to seize, to arrest. They didn't have that, but they served as consultants to local police investigators um, that were looking into wildlife crime who may not have had the expertise that the people of the NCWU had. Andy McWilliam is the main detective in this book, in this true crime book, and he had spent time working in wildlife crime in the police force before he joined the NWCU, and his specialty was bird crime. <laughs> what kind of bird crime is there? Well, that's one of the things that the book introduces us to. Uh, there are two basic types of bird crime, and in this book, they're really talking about the stealing of eggs from nests of protective species. So uh, one type of crime are egg collectors. So they go out, uh, take the eggs out of nests of rare birds. They po poke holes in them and they would blow out the yolk and the embryo. And then they'd have a hollow egg and they would place that egg in their collection, which they kept hidden because this was illegal. The other type of uh, bird crime that the book talks about is what I mentioned before, people who would go and steal eggs from protected bird of prey species and sell them to the Arabians. And so a particular uh, breed of prote protected breed is the peregrine falcon. Now, if you've ever read Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, you know the impact that DDT had on not only the species that DDT, this pesticide, was attempting to kill, but also the animals that ate those insects 
and the animals that ate the animals that ate the insects. So it went up the food chain. And in particular, there were peregrine falcon all over North America and Europe. But in the 1950s and 60s, with the use of DDT, the peregrine falcon almost disappeared in most of these places. And by the 1970s, England or Great Britain had reported only 250 um, breeding pairs. The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wildlife Flora and Fauna, or CITES, cites has listed the peregrine falcon as an Appendix 1 bird, as threatened with extinction and subject to the highest level of commercial restrictions. So in May of 2010, the authorities at Heathrow Airport contacted the NCWU and told them that they were holding a man who had bird eggs taped to his belly. And when they described the birds to Andy McWilliam, he said, those are peregrine falcon birds. And so this man was uh, trying to get these, had raided peregrine falcon bird's nest in Great Britain and was trying to get, smuggle these out, out of the country. And so in this book, we learn about the story of trying to capture this guy. Other people who have committed bird crime, the history of falconry, the idea of wildlife protections, and Hammer, the author, explains the background and motivation of McWilliam and the egg thief Jeffrey Lindrum. And this is a true crime story of a different sort, but no less suspenseful. I really enjoyed this book, and I actually am eager to read it again. The last book I want to talk about is The Bedside Book of Birds, an avian miscellany by Graham Gibson with a foreword by Margaret Atwood. And so I have, I have a hard copy of this book. And this I don't have the uh, dust cover anymore, but this book has beautiful art. And I ran across this book at a book sale. And... I had picked it up. It was a large book sale. It was the Planned Parenthood book sale with 200,000 books. And um, I picked it up and put it in my cart. Actually, I spent a long time looking at the art in it. And I picked it up because of the art. When I got home, I didn't have the book. And so I don't know what, I didn't know what happened to it. Probably what happened is I put a lot of books in my, my cart and then, you know, physically it's a, you know, like a grocery cart. I put a lot of books in my cart and then I'll go to one of the bins where you can put books that you had picked up but you don't want. And I pull out all the books and then I decide what I actually want to buy and then I leave the others in the bin. And probably what happened was I had put this book down onto the uh, table while I was doing that and I forgot it. And that was Friday night of the sale. So Saturday I went back and I searched and searched. I didn't find it in the nature area where it was. And what had happened was somebody had reshelved it in a different area of the book cell. But I did find it. And I ended up taking this home and I got this for five dollars. Uh, so when I got it home, I got it, I brought it home because of the art because of the bird images, but I started reading it. And this is a collection of stories and poems and observations. And it has introductions to each section of the book by Graham Gibson. And I read it front to back. So Frankly, I got this book because I thought I would take the images out of it and use them in other art. But I've decided this piece, this book is a piece of art in itself and it has a permanent place in my uh, collection. 
I can't say a permanent place for that many books, but this book I will keep as long as I'm alive. So one thing I found out was that, um, well, actually, so about the same time that I was reading this, I was reading Ma Margaret Atwood's The Heart Goes Last, and I was curious about the fact that Margaret Atwood wrote the introduction for this book, but Margaret Atwood also wrote in the notes in her, in The Heart Goes Last, my special thanks to Graham Gibson, who always, who though always an inspiration, did not inspire any of the characters in this book, which is a good thing. And so I looked it up, and actually, Graham Gibson and Margaret Atwood were partners from 1973 until his death in 2019, and they had a daughter. Um, and so I found that really interesting, and I forget sometimes that a lot of the authors, just like the people of Booktube know each other, at least through Booktube, if not in person or through other means, Authors, contemporary authors, also often knew each other, sometimes had relationships. And I forget that. So if you think back to all the people, let's say Gertrude Stein is a center, and all the people that she brought together who were writers, and so created relationships and connections between all these people, this is an amazing thing to me, and I forget about it all the time. All right, those are my three bird books, and so I, I, I hope nobody got turned off by the fact that they knew I was a birder, and I was going to talk about bird books, but uh, the, I, these books aren't birding books. Yes, they talk a lot about uh, birds in the uh, book, uh, by Graham Gibson. I learned a lot of things. I learned a lot about bestiaries and, and birds and books. And so um, you'll learn a lot about birds in all of these, but they each have their own purpose. The beauty of Myberg's writing, the dedication to telling a detective story, a crime story by Hammer, and then Graham Gibson's uh, collection of beautiful art, beautiful uh, writing, and his own writing. These are all enjoyable in their own right. Okay, that's all I have for today. I did want to say it's afternoon, of course, and it's kind of cloudy outside. Um, we've had some thunderstorms here, but I'm filming this on 626, and yes, I still say film instead of recording, but uh, I'm recording this on 626, or, or the 26th of June, 2023, and last night at 9.30 in my hometown in southern Arkansas, there were was a storm with straight line winds, and it was in the 90s, yesterday, 90 degrees Fahrenheit yesterday in my hometown and at, there it's still light and still hot at 9.30 and the power went out. And the power went out in several counties. My brother's without power. That means he doesn't have fan, he doesn't have air conditioner, his refrigerator is unpowered, he can't use his CPAP machine and his house was unbearably hot last night and uh, the energy company says that they probably won't have it, the power up until 10 o'clock tonight. So that's 24 hours in very hot, humid conditions without electricity. And so uh, the fact that we just have a little bit of, that we're, you know, in the low 80 degrees Fahrenheit here, a little overcast, uh, I keep it kind of warm in the house, uh, I keep thinking that's all very comfortable compared to what some of the people in uh, the counties in Arkansas that grow rice, by the way, and have rice birds um, are experiencing. So my thoughts go out to them. 
I wish I could do something, but I'm too far away. So, at the, on that sad note, <laughs> I will say goodbye. I hope to see you again sometime. Take care.